Well, hello, everybody. Today's the Day of Atonement. I'd like to start with an opening prayer this time because it is such a special day. If you bow your heads with me. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, we come before you today on this Day of Atonement 2020 as your people and as your nations from whom you're calling people. For the most part, we have been, at best, apathetic on the sidelines as our nation sank more and more ever deeply into the morass of sin and immorality. At worst, at times, some of us, your children, have participated in some of the sins and apathy and direction of our nations, which are coming into judgment by you. So today on the Day of Atonement, we seek you, today in deep repentance, personally and nationally, and to seek your mercies. I pray you will, move, you will move people from all over the world, in fact, to hear about you, to learn about you, to see you, to come to know you, dear Father, and your Savior, the, the, your Son, Yeshua, and to repent and turn to be holy people, being called out by you, the one living God. I pray not just for Christians and believers in your name, but for that you start a mighty work all across the world, that you start a mighty work, Father, among Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and atheists, I pray you smash all the works of darkness, of demonism and witchcraft, where people created in your image have been lulled into following in those evil ways. This day is a Shabbat Shabbaton, a Sabbath of Sabbaths, if you will, Father, like you say in Leviticus 23. It's like, a, like Holy of Holies. It's Sabbath of Sabbaths, a very special, significant day to you. So we honor you on this day, we worship you on this day, we look to you on this day, and we come to you on this day as you commanded to evaluate where we must repent, where we must acknowledge our sins. And Father, we come before you now and we just raise our hands in praise and ask you that as you lead us to repentance, that we really truly do change and follow the lead of your Holy Spirit. We must turn to you. We must return to you, those of us whom you've called before. Let us not just be a single day uh, of leaving you without prayer, without going a day without prayer. Let this not be a single day, a, a day of just doing without food, but that the fasting will really affect us and change us. So we ask you now to pour out your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit on the listeners, on me, all of us. Where I am weak, may you be strong to your glory and your honor. May you be glorified. May your will and your thoughts Fill my thoughts, fill my heart, fill the ears and minds of those who are listening. We look forward to the time when you will pour out your Holy Spirit on all flesh and you'll reveal yourself to the world. And that's coming soon, we hope, Father. Send back Yeshua soon. And so I commit this service into your hands, into your guidance. And we thank you and we praise you and we love you, Father. We love you. We love your son who made all this possible. Yeshua, thank you. We love you too. Love you so much. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen. Well, today is the Day of Atonement, like I said. And on this day, a lot happened. I don't know how I'm going to get through it all, frankly, but actually my wife's advising me, just tackle one aspect of it every year. But I said, well, then people say, yeah, but you left out this or left out that. And, but she might be right. Maybe that's what I got to do coming, coming up in future. Anyway, we are to uh, come before God a day of fasting, grateful, gratefully acknowledging uh, the time that God Almighty is going to work, not just with his people whom he's called out before, but he's going to start to work now with the nations, starting with our nation, with Israel, modern day Israel, America, Britain, as well as the Israel in the Middle East. And the time is coming in the, where it's going to work with nations out in the world. And I started keeping this day as a day of fasting, probably when I was about seven, eight, or nine years old. And I remember back then, we knew exactly when the sun would set. We had it all figured out. 
And I remember one time, I must have been nine or 10 years old, and I had this banana peeled like two minutes beforehand. And my brother and I would count it down, you know, 60 seconds, 59, 58, you know, and so on. And uh, <laughs> because we were so focused on the food at that time as a nine-year-old. Well, as adults, you know, I think I hope that we're focusing much more on other things. But it shouldn't be a day of just doing without food, but a day of change, as I wrote in a recent blog. Don't let this just be a day when you go without food is the title of it. So to any children who are fasting who may hear this sermon, uh, or someday in the future hear the sermon, may Yehovah, our Father, and Yeshua, our, our Savior, bless you, and may this be a blessing for you, and smile on you because of your repentance, turning to Him, and your obedience. This day is often treated overly solemnly, so today I'm going to actually, as we move into it, talk more about the joy of this day. A solemn joy in a way, but a joy of this day. In the New Covenant, it is not so detailed with intricacies because so much was fulfilled by Yeshua, and we'll speak of that. We'll speak of it and what, what that did. But it is a time for our peoples to repent and to return. God prophesied. You know the verses that said, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth. To get our attention, 2020, certainly would anyone disagree with me that this has been a year of shaking. Shaking. There have been nat natural, national ca ca catastrophes, acts of God, they call them, the wildfires, tornadoes, hurricanes, earthquakes. There's been the COVID-19, of course. There's been rioting and looting and burning. There's been confusion and violence. Yeah, God is shaking, beginning to. And from time to time, I think it might get a lot worse right after the election for a while. A lot worse. Cities will be burning again. Probably. I don't have that as a word from God. I'm just saying that it makes sense that if they don't like the election, that God may well allow that to happen as a continual shaking. And from time to time, it'll get stronger and stronger shaking. So anyway, I just got back from a, a rally in Washington, D.C. called The Return. And it happened on Sabbath day, September 26, 2020. There was another rally about a quarter mile away from us called the, uh, the March for Prayer. And between the two, there must have been 100,000 people. There are more, maybe more. Scores of thousands of people and, and believers assembled, not to, in, in our group, especially the return group, our focus was on our personal individual repentance and return. Not thinking about the repentance and the asking God to forgive the nation for their sins and other people's sins so much as my sins and the sins of those who were there. And we confessed our sins. We repented of our sins. And our nation is going to be justly, uh, I mean, judged very harshly very soon if we don't. And it's been 19 years since God sent the warning shots of 9-11 to us. I'd like you to watch Jonathan Kahn's keynote address if you can. Um, and I'll put, it in the, uh, I'll put it in my notes. And please watch that. It's 49 minutes, very, very strong. And that's what we heard. Uh, scores of thousands of us were assembled during those 10... The 10 days, I mean, uh, at the end of, I say during the 10 days, it starts from trumpets to atonement. There's 10 days of awe, they call it, in, in, uh, among the Jews anyway, from trumpets to atonement. And that was referenced uh, several times. It was a day of introspection and scores of thousands of people. At the end of Jonathan Kahn's first uh, real message, he gave a welcoming message, but then the first real uh, message he asked us if we would pray on our knees before God Almighty in repentance for our sins. And scores of thousands, maybe 40, 50,000 people got on our knees, faces to the ground. Many of us had our faces on the ground. It was very, 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 very moving. And uh, I wept. It was amazing. We must all repent. May it begin soon. And may it begin with you and me. May it begin with me. May it begin with you. Call, the ones called by God's name. Asking God to forgive us for my sins and your sins. And each of us calling on God to ask, asking him to help us repent of our apathy, our sins, and our things that we're tolerating in our lives that we shouldn't. 
And that's a lot of what today's about. It's going to picture a time when the nations will finally come to God in repentance. The speakers had it right. They talked about confession, but they also said confession is just the first step. It's admitting your sin. But repentance, which is what we were there for really, is after you have seen and confessed your sins that you turn from, teshuva, you, re, you turn away from sin, you turn to God after you confess your sins. So many of the speakers and many of the prayers that were given had to do with how we have left you, Father. We have left you, God, and we must repent. Return was the theme. It was very, very, very satisfaction, satisfactory to me to watch that. I hope God was moved. I think he was in the, right near the middle or so of Jonathan Kahn's keynote message. There was thunder, a, a rolling light thunder, not, not like the thunders we get here in Florida that can make you jump out of bed <laughs> or out of your chair. No, this was a rolling rumble right while he was speaking. I remember him stopping saying, hey, do you hear that? Has America passed the point of no return? What lies ahead? Judgment? and calamity or return and revival. It can be both. It can be that through shaking, that revival comes. Did you hear that? It can be through shaking that revival comes. And it was like a boom, And some may not have even heard it. And then uh, as we lifted holy arms and praise, I loved it. This day is a lot to do with restored relationships. Day of Atonement, because God's whole goal is not to punish. He does not. He will punish if we don't repent. Don't get me wrong. God's whole goal is that we repent and that he show us his loving kindness, his mercy, and his tender heartedness. I want to read from John, uh, Jeremiah 18, verses 1 to 11. Jeremiah 18, verse 1 to 11. The word came to me from Jehovah, Jeremiah says, Arise and go down to the potter's house. And there I'll cause you to hear my words. And then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was making something on, at the wheel. I'm in Jeremiah 18, verse 4 now. The vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, and he made it again. So he made another vessel, another clay jar, as it seemed good to the potter to make. He didn't like the first one. And then the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Says Jehovah, look at... As the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. The instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to pluck up, to pull down, and destroy it, if that nation, Jeremiah 18, 8, I've already spoken, God says, I'm going to destroy this nation. Verse 8, if that nation against whom I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I had thought to bring upon it. I will relent. I won't do it. I don't care if you've heard about it from Jonah. I don't care if you've heard about it from the prophets. I don't care if you've heard about it in the written documents. If you people will repent and turn to me, I will relent of the evil I thought to bring upon it, the disaster. Do you believe that? Some of you don't believe it. Some of you think once God's spoken, written, or whatever, it's, it's a done deal. That's not what I just read. If that nation will repent, if that nation against whom I've spoken turns from its evil, I verse 8, I will relent from the disaster. On the other hand, he says, if I have said that I'm going to bless this nation, build it, and make it grow, and that nation turns from me, does not obey my voice, verse 9 and 10, then I will relent concerning the good that I had said I would do to it, to benefit it. Now, therefore, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Jehovah, Behold, I am fashioning a disaster, and I am devising a plan against you. Return now. Okay, that's my stated purpose. I'm, I'm going to smack you guys hard. But my real stated purpose is that you return. Every one of you hearing this, don't just think about America or India or Mexico or wherever you're hearing this from. And many of you are hearing this in China and Korea and Iraq and, and, the, and European and African countries. Wherever you are, return. 
now every one of you from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. I heard, by the way, that there were like a hundred million people from around the world who were tuned in to the return as it was being broadcast because it was a national and global day of repentance and returning. Well, the spring holy days picture God working with those that he's calling right now as first fruits. Passover, days of unleavened bread, the wave sheaf offering, the and then the Pentecost. Pentecost is kind of a transition uh, feast day. And then Pentecost, then we, I believe, we're resurrected on Pentecost. It doesn't make sense to be resurrected in the fall and then have all those seven last plagues and all that have to happen. What are, you gonna, what are we going to do? We are first fruits, okay? And the two wave loaves that are lifted up on Pentecost pictured the, uh, the, the first fruits of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of the wheat. Now, in the fall, it pictures God working with the rest of humanity, the rest of the world, the rest of, of the nations. So now it's time to focus with these fall holy days on the rest of the world, starting with the Feast of Trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah, the Day of Bless, when he returns to an unknowable day, probably on Mount of Olives. I say unknowable because the, there'd be so much debris and, and pollution in the sky that uh, good luck trying to find a, uh, a tiny little sliver of new moon by which we know it's the Day of Trumpets. Plus the, the prophecies about the earth teetering and tottering like a drunkard. After trumpets, we have atonement. So what's this day about? There's more that can be said about this day than I'll even have time to cover. So I'm going to move quickly. We're to fast from sundown last night to, on, on the 10th day of the, of the Hebrew month. Uh, this year is the 28th of September, uh, 2020. And it says, no food, no work. You can look up the passage in Leviticus 23. Verses 26 to 32. We always put these on the board. Leviticus 23, 26 to 32. Go ahead and read those later. In the passage, it's called Yom Kippurim. Actually, Ha Yom Kippurim. It's not just Yom Kippur, but Kippurim. Go back and look at the original Hebrew. It's a, it's a day of coverings, plural. Uh, we we shorten it down to Yom Kippur, or even the day. Uh, uh, ha Yom. Ha means the, and then, and then Yom. But it's a day of covering, and the word there, uh, kippur, has to do with kafar, to cover, to expiate, to atone, it was also similar to the word used for the lid, the covering on the mercy seat. And remember, the mercy seat was like the, the throne, the seat of God. Underneath, below the mercy seat were the Ten Commandments. It says in James, I think it's in James, mercy triumphs over judgment, over judgment, mercy triumphs over judgment. So the mercy seat was above the, where the Ten Commandments were, and so it shows that point that mercy is superior to judgment. They have coverings, plural, because a lot was being covered, the sins and the cleansings that were happening to the tabernacle itself, to the altars, to the incense, to, to the ark, all of that was being cleansed. The people were being atoned for, the priest was being atoned for, all of the, you know, there's a lot of covering going on for a lot of different kinds of sins. So it's a day of coverings. So that passage, Leviticus 23, speaks of it. The entire chapter 16 of Leviticus, much of Leviticus 25, also speaks of this day of Jubilees. Leviticus 16 is about the goats, the bulls, the rams, everything else, the various sacrifices. Nobody was to work except one man, the high priest. What does that mean to you? That is so significant. You and I cannot justify ourselves before God by our own works. We mess it up trying. God says, let my son do it. Let the high priest I've appointed, let him be the one to do it. And so the high priest who that day was out in just simple white tunic, not his royal high priestly garbs, not, no, not at all, by the end of the day, after he'd slaughtered the bull for himself and the goats and the, and the, uh, the goat and the, 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 the sheep and different things, he was one bloody mess. I mean bloody, like literally bloody. I don't mean that as a swear word to you people in England, in Australia. The blood, he had to get the blood and sprinkle it on the mercy seat. And then he had a lot of work to do that day. I mean, can you imagine... Killing a bull 
getting it onto the altar, all the things you would have to do with that bull, and then the and then the the goat. It's hard to kill an animal, big animal. It's hard. It's very hard. And then to uh, get it all going. Anyway, have I have a sermon. Uh, then also the Azazel to put all the confess all the sins of Israel on the Azazel. I have a sermon talking about Azazel. I uh, do not want to give a sermon on atonement about Satan because this day is not about him. Many of you ministers out there are still teaching that. It's wrong. Absolutely wrong. We say, you know, that everything to do with the temple and the tabernacle points to, Yesh to Yeshua, to Jesus. The curtains do, the colors do, the animals do, the altar does, the bronze labor, everything points to Yeshua. But somehow when we come to Azazel, somehow when we come to incense, it, it doesn't picture Yeshua anymore. It pictures something else. Well, Azazel, I'm not going to suddenly start shifting over to Azazel. It doesn't make any sense. I mean to uh, Satan as Azazel. And I gave a whole sermon on that. So, not one scripture, let me just say this about Azazel, those of you who still believe that picture of Satan, that's almost blasphemous in my mind. All I ask anyone to do, who disagrees with me and others on this, show me one verse, just one, that says all our sins are put on Satan's head. People confuse the fact that the Bible says, cast out a scoffer and, and, and strife shall cease. And so at the beginning of the reign of Christ on earth, he has to get rid of Satan, Satan and he has to put him in the, the, uh, the uh, bottomless pit. It doesn't say there that all of our sins are put on his head. It doesn't say that. So anyway, find me one scripture. There are lots of scriptures that say Yeshua is the one who takes away the sins of the world. John 1, 29, John the Baptist, born among women, no greater man, Yeshua said. And he said, next day, John, John 1, 29, uh, he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, not Satan, not Azazel pointing to, no, this Azazel was not Satan. Isaiah 53, 6, Isaiah 53, 11, very clearly says that all of our sins are put onto Yeshua, unto the righteous servant of God, his son. So you Muslims, Yeshua, whose name means salvation, he died for you too. You Buddhists, the son of God died for you as well. Please respond to the calling. You know, some of you are hearing this who are Buddhists. You know God's calling you, the one true living God. Respond to that call. Keep listening. To this website, other websites as, as well, but keep listening to this one. God is calling some people who are currently Buddhist, some of you who are currently Hindu or atheist. God is calling some of you to leave your gods and goddesses and depart from the sins of your youth and the sins of paganism. Listen to the words of Holy Scripture written by the hand of God and come to be, come to be in, at one, come to be a, reunited, reconciled with the one true living God. He loves you. Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, witches. All of you want to come out of that. Respond to it. Respond to it. Hallelujah. So this is, though it's a solemn day, it's also a day where there are elements of joy. We want to get into that. But before the joy, we in the nation have to repent of our sins with weeping and mourning. So once we do, that's why I started the prayer the way I did. There's joy and peace after you repent. Remember David said, uh, Restore to me the joy of your salvation, right at the end of Psalm 51 in his prayer of repentance. He said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and I will uh, convict sinners of their ways, and I'll bring people to righteousness, he says. Now, some things I really, really like about this day that are very positive. The high priest, only one man, and only one time a year could come into the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle or later the temple. On this day, just one man could come in there, sprinkle blood on the mercy seat, scared to death, the covering of the ark. It was a fearsome time for him. Uh, today, because of what the true high priest, the one that the high priest all pointed to, Yeshua, the Son of God, 
And because his blood is worth so much more than all of ours put together, because he's the son of God. And because he's not just a blood of, he didn't just have the blood of bulls or goats or sheep or whatever, or doves. No, he is the son of God. And so his blood requirements in Hebrews 9, it's very clear. You should mark that down and read it. Put it on the board there, Hebrews 9, the whole chapter. Just study that. That one time, one sacrifice for all time, forever and ever, forever done, all our sins are forever forgiven. When we acknowledge Yeshua as our Savior and ask him to be the life that we now live, ask him to live obediently in us as he, as he did when he was on the earth. You can't acknowledge Christ and continue in fornication and adultery and lying and stealing and breaking the Sabbath. That's not a saved life. The proof of your salvation is a changing life. You won't be perfect all at once. I'm not perfect yet. I'm not yet. I still fall into sin from time to time. But the way of life of sin, that has to definitely stop. Now in Mark 15, verses 37 to 39. Mark 15, verses 7 to 39. 37 to 39. Jesus cried out with loud voice, breathe his last. The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion saw it, he stood opposite him and he cried out and said, This surely was the, the Son of God. So when Yeshua died, the veil that separated the holy place where the priest went in to the most holy place, the holy of holies, where only the high priest could go in once a year, that very heavy, thick veil was ripped from top to bottom. A miracle. Was God's judgment. We, we read later on, I think it's in Hebrews 9, it talks about how the veil was a picture of the body, the flesh of Christ. So when his body was ripped open, when his body was ripped open uh, with a spear and by his crucifixion, uh, then the, what it pictured, the veil, was rent apart, meaning we can now have access to God's holy of holies. Now, all of you have been washing the blood of the Son of God. Now, all of us, anytime we want to, can come to the Holy of Holies. Anytime we want. I hope we avail ourselves more of it. Uh, some of you may not pray all that much because you think you have to always have a 20 or 30 or 40 minute prayer. No, you don't. I try to have a longer prayer in the morning or at night when I go to bed, morning when I get up. But what I'm trying to do and convey to all of you, pray many times in a day. Paul talked about praying always. So all through the day, you can have short conversations. Just like you do with your husband or your wife. You're not talking with them all day long. But you have short conversations. And now we can come boldly. Hebrews 4.16. We can come boldly to the throne of grace. Hebrews 4.16. And it's possible only through Christ. We'll read now Ephesians 3, verses 11 and 12. According to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ. I'm breaking into the middle of a thought because Paul's sentences are so long. In Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. I don't have confidence to come before God the Father on my righteousness, but I do because I am in Christ and he is in me. We have to really get this concept of being in Christ in each, and he in us. We have boldness and access. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. So it's Hebrews 10, not Hebrews 9. Hebrews 10, verse 20. And having a high priest over the house of God, let's draw near with a true heart, full assurance of faith, and so on. My point is we have boldness now. Isn't that a wonderful thing? That we don't all just have to wait for a high priest once a year to go in to try to consecrate the nation again? Every one of us today, because of Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua, Yeshua the Messiah, the Son of God, what he did, I can now come before God's throne anytime I want in full confidence because I am covered by the life of Yeshua. 
That's the holiness and righteousness that God sees. So that's a, day, a great reason for joy uh, that we now have access before God on these days. The day of Jubilee, another reason for great joy is mentioned in Leviticus 25. I recommend you guys read at least the first 10 or 15 verses of Leviticus 25. And towards the end, it talks about some more there. On Jubilee, imagine you own a debt, your, your mortgage, your credit cards. And on a Jubilee year, your creditors would come to you and say, I've canceled. I've canceled all your debt. People who had to sell their land got to have their land come back. They're allowed to return to the land. We know Israel will return to the land of Israel, the land of Israel, after Yeshua lands on the Mount of Olives. Zechariah 14 says that. And it seems very likely to me that the, the time Christ returns will be a jubilee year. I don't know that we know for sure when the jubilee year will be. I don't know if we know that for sure. But some believe that it was at the founding of Israel in 1917, and then uh, 50 years later, in 1967, the conquest of Jerusalem. And then 50 years later, Jerusalem's acknowledged as the true capital by America. And then 50 years later would put us to 2067. That seems like a long, long time too long away uh, for the return of Christ. But it does, seem, it does seem to make sense to me that he comes at a jubilee years. Others tell me that probably the year he died, 30 AD, was a jubilee year. And so 2,000 years later would be 40 sets of 50 jubilees. I mean, um, I, I mean, uh, yeah, 20, 40 times 50. It'd be 40, 40 times 50. Uh, so you come up with 2,000. So some are thinking he might come in 2030. I don't know. I don't know. But imagine all the debts being canceled and having your land back that you had to sell. And if you were a Hebrew bond servant indentured servant or something like that you had to be freed in the jubilee years so you can read that in uh, leviticus 25 verses 8 to 12. what you see here is a a long shofar and i, I believe that the true the true shofars are are ram's horn I have, I have a little one here a little ram's horn i don't know how to blow it so well but this is a shofar i bought in israel a ram's horn see don't I look like a ram? And then here we have the, I think it's a kudu horn. And for some reason, they use this a lot as well. But on this day, when it says uh, Leviticus 25, uh, uh, at, uh, verse 9, you saw, okay, on the 50th year, it's a year of jubilee, 50, every 50th year on the 10th day of the 7th month, which is a day of atonement, you shall uh, make the trumpet sound throughout the land. Now, the word there for trumpet is shofar. You know, one of these, or or one of these. So you shall make the trumpet. It doesn't mean the silver horn. It means this. It means, it means this trumpet. So that was the shofar. I used the kudu horn there. They often use those now. And that shall be blown to announce it's a jubilee year. And you shall consecrate the 50th year, Leviticus 25, verse 10, and proclaim liberty throughout all the land of all, to all the inhabitants. Shall be a jubilee. A jubilee is a great time of freedom, of joy, of partying. On the Day of Atonement, don't forget. Because you shall return each man to his possession, to the land that was given to your family. You had to sell it because you were poor. And you get the land back. You get your debts canceled. You get your family members who are indentured servants and bonded servants back. You know, kind of like a Hebrew slave, not quite a slave. And uh, you were supposed to let the land rest another year. You did already the previous year. You can let it rest again. So um, it's the Jubilee, verse 12. It shall be holy to you and you shall eat its produce from the field. So, I love atonement because it's freedom from debt. Get your land back. Uh, family members who are indentured servants are freed up, and it's just a wonderful time. What does that all picture? 
we are freed from our debt of sin. We're freed from our commitments of wrong. You know, all the wrong we've done is being, it's, it's canceled. It's all canceled. I think that's wonderful. We get to re uh, return to the land. And in our case, uh, Yeshua is going to lead us back to the Garden of Eden at some point. We who are in the first fruits will have holy city of Jerusalem as our promised land. And Israel, who's all scattered as captives, Americans, Britons, and so on, if we don't repent, they will be, we will be beaten in war and taken as slaves in other countries for a while. I am not kidding. That's all in prophecy. Because there are many verses that talk about that the trumpet will sound and God will bring back his captives, not from Egypt, but from the Northland, and so on with the sound of the shofar. That hasn't happened yet. Some of you think it has happened already. It hasn't happened yet. Another great reason to be upbeat on this day is that it is the book of life. I'm not just in there for one more year, like Jews are trying to believe it's going to happen to them. Orthodox Jews are terrified that they may not be left in the book of life or might be taken out. So they every year they need to be added in for one more year. So from Yom Teruah, trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, all the way to atonement are the ten days of awe, of self-introspection, repentance, and trying to amend their ways enough that God will finally say, okay, I'll put you in the book of life for one more year. In the New Covenant, we can be much more certain about that. If we've repented and turned to God, we are in his book of life. Moses knew he was in the book of life. Remember when he was arguing with God, not arguing, but pleading with God for Israel. And he said, if you're not going to spare the nation of my people, just take me out of your book of life. He knew he was in the book of life, is my point. Now, we can be blotted from the book of life, it says in Revelation 3, if we go into a life of sin and permanently and, and defiantly blow it against God. But uh, as a general rule, I think uh, we repent, we acknowledge Yeshua as our Savior. That puts us into the book of life. Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, verse 3, Philippians 4, verse 3, I urge you also, true companion, help these women. And he says, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. So somehow Paul knew that when these people accept Yeshua as Savior, that their names are added to the book of life. And you're wondering, well, how do I know that's going to happen? God Almighty, Abba, our dear God in heaven, God Most High, loves you so much. Philippians 1.6, Paul says, I'm confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good thing, a good work in you, will finish it, will complete it, until the day of Christ. Philippians 1.6, I love that verse. God intends to finish what he started in me. So I, had, I used to have this little uh, statue, statuette uh, of a half-finished carving of a man. And on the statuette it says, be patient. I wish I had that to show you right now. Be patient. And God isn't finished with me yet. Maybe I'll get a picture if I can find it and send it to you. That we can post it. Send it to Scott. Thank you, Scott and Brandy, for all your work, by the way. You guys, if you like Light on the Rock, this website would not be having anything happening without Scott and Brandy working so hard on it. I just thank them so much. John 5, 24, we pass from life unto, from death to life. We pass from death into life. 1 John 3, 14. Look at John 5, 24. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. He shall not come into judgment but has passed from death into life. So when we believe in Yeshua and believe enough that we want him to express his risen life in us, we should be witnesses of the resurrection of Christ. How? By our changing lives, so dramatically changing, that people are saying, whatever you have, I want, I want some of that. And you say, I have nothing except the life of Jesus Christ, the life of Yeshua living inside of me. 
and I've passed from death to everlasting life. John 5, 24. Let's put it up there one more time as I speak about it here. Uh, who, whoever believes in the one who sent me and, and, the, and, and in me uh, has everlasting life. If you hear my word and believe in him who sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment. So that's another reason to be very happy on today. Let's find some more reasons. Uh, we can be happy because this day pictures Yeshua putting all our sins upon himself and carrying those sins away. I gave the whole sermon about a Zazel goat. A Zazel is not a being. A Zazel is a definition of boat of goat of departure, goat of separation, goat of departure. Remember again, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away not just the sins of the Jews, but the sins of the world. You got that? All of you over there in Sri Lanka, all of you in Madagascar, Costa Rica, in the Philippines, Korea, Thailand, all of you in Nigeria and Kenya. Kenya, I've got a very special spot for because I'm working with a pastor there who's working with some children. So this is not a day that I'm going to focus on Satan because it's not, it, no, I just won't. There's still too far, too far many, uh, too many ministers who still do. This is not a day about Satan. It's a, it's a day about Yeshua. He takes all of our sins. I'll read that later on. It says the high priest is to, is to get the other goat, the Azazel goat, and lay on his head with both hands and then declare on his head all the sins of the nation of Israel. All of them. And then a fit man is to lead it out. And the all nation of Israel, I'm sure, watched that goat get out of there. They were happy. And you can be happy that whatever you did in the past, however bad it was. Have you murdered someone? That can be forgiven. Are you a drunk and an alcoholic? That is forgiven if you come before God. Whatever, how bad you think your sin is. Are you a Sabbath breaker? Are you a liar and a thief? Are you an adulterer, fornicator? What are you? Are you a pedophile? Yeah. God can forgive it all, all of it, when we confess it before him and turn from it. You don't have to feel like you still carry the weight of past sins that you have repented of. They're gone. They're gone. Another point here. We can be happy because on this day they read the book of Jonah. Okay, so what's so good about the book of Jonah? The book of Jonah is about no matter again how evil a nation, a city-state could be, how evil and wicked and violent people can be. When they turned to God and repented, Jonah chapter 3 verses 5 to 10 tells that story. God heard. God saw. God was moved. Did they understand all the doctrines of God? No, they didn't. Did they understand about the Sabbath and the holy days? Did they understand when they repented of their violence and all of that? About everything to do with idolatry? I, I doubt it. God saw enough of a change that he relented from the evil, the disaster he was going to bring on, just like we just read in Jeremiah 18. So in Jonah 3, verses 5 to 10, the people of Jonah believed God. They proclaimed the fast, and they put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. The word came to the king, and he heard about it. He arose from his throne. He laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. I'm in Jonah 3, verse 7. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published that every single person and living thing here, man, beast, flock, must not eat or taste anything. Don't let them eat. Don't drink water. Let that man and beast be covered with sackcloth, cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way. Turn from his evil way. That's what I've got to do. That's what you've got to do. It's what I've got to do. From the violence. They were particularly known for their violence. A lot of murder. A lot of brutality. A lot of people being hit over the head and robbed. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so we may not perish? That's why I like this day, because on this day, the book of 
almost said the book of Nineveh, but the, it's about Nineveh, is read. Then God saw their works, verse 10, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster he had said he would bring upon them, and he, he had said he would do it. And he did not do it. Just like it says in Jeremiah 18. The Nineveh, Nineveh, Nineveh is in present-day Mosul area of western Iraq. They were very pagan, very Gentile, violent city-state. They were evil. And yet Almighty God, the living God, the true God, he responded to them when they very powerfully repented. So you people of the Middle East, you people who are Muslims, you people of Abu Dhabi, you people of UAE, you people of Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Somalia, okay, Algeria, Tunisia, you people of India and China, Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia, all of you, all of you in South America, Bolivia, Peru, yeah, I know where Lima, Peru is. I'm not like most people. I've traveled in 32 countries. I, can, I know where your countries are. Chile, Brazil, Uruguay, Venezuela, okay? And the islands off of Venezuela. God can hear you too if you repent and turn from your wicked ways. The good news is the book of Jonah was read. Another thing of good news, God's presence when we do repent, when the nations repent, will we'll be a place of mercy, of atoning, of forgiveness. God's presence. As we fast today, we don't just go hungry. We seek his presence and we find him to be a wonderful, wonderful human, not human being, wonderful being who is so merciful. I find this day to be a positive day because the work of atoning is done by one man, the high priest. Today, that high priest is Yeshua the Christ. No one else was to work, just the high priest. Just the high priest. There were several animals to sacrifice. I kind of mentioned this already, but let's look at it some more. There was the bull that was slain and, and the blood sprinkled. And Isaiah 53, 11, it all pictures Yeshua the high priest. After that, he's the high priest of the new covenant, okay? He's the high priest of all of humanity. After that, all the sins of the world were put on a zazzle, taken far away. Isaiah 53, 11 says, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Who takes away the sins of the world? Here it is. And by his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many. For he, God saying, my righteous servant, referring to Yeshua, he shall bear their iniquities. You know, they don't even read Isaiah 53, I don't believe, in the Torah's half Torah sections anymore. So I will post the scriptures in the notes, but read just selected portions from Leviticus 16 for time's sake. I hope you bear with me on that. Leviticus 16 is about many of the sacrifices and Hebrews 9. I just give you an assignment. I want you to read on your own Leviticus 16 and 9 or we'll be here forever. But the Bible in Leviticus 16, first of all, in verses 12 to 14, speaks of coals of fire it goes from the altar that were being offered uh, for offering and sacrifices on this day for sacrifices. And, and they, the priest was to use those hot coals to be the fire, the heat, the fuel uh, that would fuel the incense to produce that big thick cloud of sweet smelling incense that would cover the mercy seat lest the high priest die. Those coals came from the bull that was just sacrificed, picturing again Yeshua. And what does incense picture? It pictures the prayers of the saints, the intercessory prayers of the saints. But who does the most interceding is Yeshua. 1 John 2, right? He is our advocate. 1 John 2, verse 1, he's our advocate. He defends us before God. And the prayers of a righteous man, a righteous person avails much. And who is the righteous man? It's Christ. There's none righteous otherwise. That's what it says in Romans, I think, chapter 2. There's none righteous, no, not one. See the Romans 2 or 3. But my point, though, is the righteous man is, again, Christ. So those coals of fire that lit up the incense pictured, again, Yeshua fueling all of those prayers. Isn't that beautiful? I think it's beautiful. My wife told me that just this morning. 
What a beautiful thought. Leviticus 16. Verses 15 to 34, we'll just read parts of it. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil. He's now in the Holy of Holies. Do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. And so he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of all their transgressions. Verse 17, jumping ahead, there shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting, except the high priest. Only the high priest can do this. Only Yeshua can do this. Verse 20, when he's made an end of atoning the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting, the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Here's the Azazel, the live goat. Aaron shall lay both hands, both his hands on the head of the live goat, just like that, and confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel, including yours and mine, and all their transgressions concerning all, notice the word all, concerning all their transgressions, all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man or a fit man. The goat, verse 22, shall bear on itself all their iniquities. That's why I say there is no verse anywhere in the Bible that says that applies to Satan. Nope, not a single one. If there is, show me. I've just read you a couple, Isaiah 53, verse 6, Isaiah 53, verse 11, John 1, 29. I think the one in, I said, there's one in Peter, 2 Peter or 1 Peter, uh, that, he can, that he carries all of, our, all of our sins. So I'll leave it with that. We'll go to Leviticus 16. Let's jump now to verse 29. There shall be a statute forever for you in the seventh month on the tenth day. That's September 20, uh, what is it? September 28, is it? lost track of time. September 28, I believe, is what it is today. And on Day of Atonement, yeah, September 28, Monday. Uh, you shall afflict your, in 2020, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all. Everybody was to do no work at all if you lived in Israel. On that day, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you that you may be clean from all your sins before Yehovah. It's a Sabbath of solemn rest for you and you shall afflict your souls. That's been understood to mean fasting. It is a statute forever. So the high priest does the work of saving us. The high priest, Yeshua, is the one who atones for us. The high priest is the one who makes sure all of our sins are covered. I like that. I really like that. Another reason I'm so happy today is that now Jews try to wear white. I'm wearing white today, but I, did, I do a lot of times on a holy day anyway. But I'm not wearing a white shirt because there's so much significance in a white shirt as what it pictures, who it pictures. Romans 13, 14, I am picturing putting on Christ. Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Put on the Lord, Jesus Christ. Galatians 3.27 For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. As many of you as were baptized have put him on. He's like a garment that we wear over us. It covers us. That's what people see. That's what God sees. Not the old me, but hopefully the covering of Yeshua. He's my covering. Christ becomes my life, Colossians 3, verses 2 to 6, you know, 2 to 7. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died. You died, the old you. It's not talking about I've quit breathing. He means the old me is gone. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's how I can be in God the Father, by being in perfect Christ. For you died. We are in God the Father also, by the way, in 1 John, I think it's chapter 4, and there it talks about that a lot. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. By the way, if I say 1 John 4 and it's not there, look at 1 John 3 or 5 or whatever. But I think it's 1 John 4. But I mean, sometimes these thoughts come to my mind, and I don't have the whole Bible memorized. But uh, Colossians 3, verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, appears... Christ, who is my life now, 
appears. Then you will appear with him also in glory. Therefore, now here's the point. You cannot, you guys, you cannot just accept Christ and think it's all okay to keep on living the way you live because it doesn't matter because it's all Christ's righteousness. No, Christ's righteousness in you will make him live again in you the way he lived the first time. Righteously. It's him doing it. So verse 5 says, Therefore mortify, put to death the parts of your lives that are so wrong, fornication, including mental fornication, pornography, all of that. Pornography, it's got to stop. Uncle Ask God to take that desire away and just give it up. Tell him, I, I, I don't want to have these lustful thoughts. I don't want to have those pictures in my mind. And men and, and women, but especially men, we've got to release that and, and ask God to forgive that and take it away from us. And, and get out of that fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming on the sons of disobedience. We're not sons of disobedience anymore. In, once you, in, in which you once walked yourselves. You once lived in them. So we don't want to be like that anymore. That's not our way anymore. Now, no, yeah, we, I do too. We slip up. I'm not perfect either. But boy, when you slip up, repent with deep repentance and sorrow and do everything you need to to stop it and turn from it. Stop doing it. Whatever it is. You know the it's in your life, the sins in your life. Now, Christ not only took upon himself our sins, he also, because he took that all away, he paid the debt, okay? But we also need something else. We need righteousness. So he gave us his righteousness. At the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, around verse 30, 31, it talks about Christ, our righteousness. How he has become for us the righteousness of God. Christ, our righteousness. Go back and look that up, 1 Corinthians 1, the end of it. But look at this verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21. I'll read it out of the Holman Bible, the Apologetic Study Bible. Uh, he made the one, that's Yeshua, who did not know sin to be sin. Not just a sin offering, to be sin for us. He took all of our sins upon himself. Talk about being filthy. A man who was totally without sin, a man who had never known sin personally, took every sin of the whole world upon himself and all the wrath that that brought, all the separation that that brought from God, all of the penalty of death that that brought, all of the pain and suffering and anguish that that brought, all the murders, adulteries, and liars, and lies, and brutalities, and beatings, and injustices, idolatries, all of that was put on him. He in turn says, now you know no righteousness, I know no sin, I'll take yours, and you who know no true righteousness of God, I'm going to let you have my righteousness. Some of you have a hard time accepting this. I don't know why it's plain as day. Okay, read it again, 2 Corinthians 5.21. He made the one who didn't know sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God, of God himself in him. By being in Christ, we become the righteousness of very God. Are you, are you listening, people? Are you hearing me? Don't keep fighting that. Some of you keep fighting that, resisting that. Philippians 3, verse 9. Paul said, I want to be found in him, in Christ, in Yeshua. Not having my own righteousness. I don't want that. Which is from the law. When I obey the law and I do the right thing, there's a certain level of human righteousness. But Paul says, that's not enough, folks. 
That's not enough. Because Yeshua said, Become you therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. He said, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God's righteousness. Our own righteousness is not enough. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that, listen now, watch it on the screen here, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. So when all those sins are put on the head of Azazel, something else that happens in the New Covenant is we are given the righteousness of God himself by faith. Wow! Now if we're given that righteousness of God by faith, we have to let that live in us and walk in us, changing us. Now we can go on and on about the Day of Atonement. It's a time picturing God reconciling the nation and eventually all of not just all Israel and the descendants of Israel, but eventually the whole world to himself. Even in the Old Testament, by the way, there's so many scriptures that speak about Yeshua or Yehovah, our righteousness, the, the Lord, our righteousness, the Lord, our righteousness. You get that? The Lord, our righteousness. So Pentecost pictures a time when the nation in the old, the old Covenant, had to stop and wait and watch the high priest do everything and cleanse them all, put all the sins of the nation on the Azazel, march them out. Today, Yeshua did that one time, once and for all, and we're saved by him. We're saved. He's, he's the Savior. He's not, I'm not, I can't save myself. I'm not the creator of the, new, of the new me. I'm not the creator of the righteousness of God. God is. We're rewarded by our good works. But reward is not, is not about salvation and eternal life. Reward is just what we're going to do for eternity. And God will reward us if we're changing and growing and overcoming. But our works mess us up. So God tells Israel, just sit in your tents and buy your tents and watch what goes on. But let the high priest do the redeeming, the saving, and the casting out of the sins on the Azazel goat. A lot of you have a problem with really fully accepting that you're saved by grace. You say, yeah, I know we're saved by grace, but you know, i got to do something. Yeah, you do. You have to abide in Christ. That's the something you got to do. Uh, hear my sermons on holiness, becoming holy. Hear my sermons on fighting, winning the fight of your life, lives, because that's what I talk about. The hard work that I'm supposed to be doing is doing everything in my power to abide in Christ, to stay attached, not to let it get cut off or torn off, I, then I become just like a branch that's withered. John 15, verse 4 and 5 and 6. Right? 5 and 6 especially. I just become a, a withered branch. Useless. Good for nothing except to be burned in the pile, pile of uh, sticks. That's my hard work. Stay abiding in Him. Studying Him. And then applying what God tells me in His Word to do good works around my community. You'll read that in Ephesians 2, verse 10. You're... you're we're, we're his workmanship, created for good works. That doesn't save us, but it's the proof of salvation. And we go pray with people, and we pray for the sick, and we help baptize people, and we bring God's word to these people. Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 10, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his love, Ephesians, 4, uh, Ephesians 2, verse 4, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive again with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up together, together with Christ, and made us sit together, together with Christ, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Paul says, as far as I'm concerned, since I am in Christ, wherever Christ is, I am. So if Yeshua is sitting on the right hand of the God's throne, so am I, because I'm in Christ. So are you. That's what Paul's saying. He's made us sit together with him in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. Let that sink in. Because of atonement. Because of Passover earlier for us, and now the national viewpoint, the nations will have this opportunity that in ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. Are you saved? Yes, you are. Lots of verses talk about you are saved. One's right, one's right here. You have been saved. 
There are other verses that talk about being saved. There are other verses that talk about shall be saved. It's a process that culminates finally at the resurrection when this mortality puts on immortality. But if we stay the course, we are saved. And that not of yourself, it's the gift of God. It's not of yourself, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Yeah, I worked hard for the salvation. No, you didn't. It's a gift. It's a gift. Verse 8, look at it again. It's a gift. It's the gift of God. Now, after we've been saved so no one can boast, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. So, works don't save us, but we have to change. We have to overcome. We have to win the battles. And when we fail and get all bloodied up, we come before him in heartfelt thanks, thanksgiving for his presence and love and ask him for his mercy one more time. Get back in the fight. Get attached to the vine. So we're not saved by obedience and good works, but once we're offered that, we are told to live a life of good works. An unchanged life is not a saved life, folks. If you're still the way you've always been, you're not saved. You're not even being saved yet. You respond to those calls. If you're a drunk, you stop drinking. If you're an alcoholic or if you're a, if you're a fornicator or liar or adulterer, you stop that. Romans 3.22, for by the deeds of the law can no flesh be made right. You can't be justified. Romans 3.28, we conclude that a man is justified by faith, by faith in Christ and his righteousness, see, apart from the deeds of the law, apart from the deeds of the law. So I urge all of you to carefully read, I'm running out of time here, Hebrews 9 is so important. Hebrews 9 Verse 7, but into the second part of the tabernacle, the temple, the second part is the most holy place, the holy of holies. The high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, though. Now you and I can go in any time we want. Hebrews 9, verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. I'll have more scriptures in my notes that you can look at later, but he entered the most holy place once for all, for all who accept him. One time, he's not going to be crucified again, having obtained eternal redemption. I have been redeemed not just for one year, folks. I have received eternal redemption. Hebrews 9, verse 12. Hebrews 9, verse 26 he says he's not like the old high priest that had to keep doing it year after year because sin kept doing it and people kept sinning and, and the blood of bulls and goats wasn't enough. Hebrews 9, 26, Christ then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages, he's appeared to, he's appeared to put away sin, put away sin, put away sin. Who's doing it, Satan or, or Jesus? It's blasphemous to say it's Satan. Let me just say it. It's not right. And you guys who know it's not right need to speak up. Don't let your ministers keep preaching this. It's so wrong. He, Christ, has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it's and, and John 1 29, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and on him are put all the sins of the world. Okay, on him. Isaiah 53 11, okay? So Christ was offered once, verse 28, to bear the sins of many. Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. And to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin. Because my sin's gone. So when he appears for me, he's appearing apart from sin. And that's why I can eagerly Wait for him. That's why I'm excited that he's coming. 
That's why I can't wait. Don't be afraid of the judgment, it says in 1 John. Okay, don't be afraid of it. If you are in Christ, I need to give a sermon on that. Okay, let's read that again in Hebrews 9. Christ was offered once, at verse 27, verse 28, I mean. Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many to those who eagerly, if you're afraid, you're not going to be eagerly waiting for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. Hebrews 10, 14. Every priest stands ministering daily, offering repeatedly the same old sacrifices, which can never take away sins. There was no, there was no chair in the Holy of Holies or in the tabernacle. There was no chair inside because the priests always had work to do. They never finished. But on the cross, Yeshua said, finished! It is finished. But this man, Hebrews 10, verse 12, after he'd offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down. He's done. Now he's working in you and me. He's still doing a mighty work. But as far as his role of salvation, what he had to do, he's done. He sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Verse 14, for by one offering he's perfected forever those who are being made holy, being sanctified. For by one offering he has, has perfected forever. Do you believe that? By faith you should. By one offering, what's your name? Put your name in. He has perfected Susan, Linda, John, Matthew, what's your name? Scott? <laughs> he's perfected Scott forever. No, he's, oh no, I'm not perfect yet. By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. I need to give a sermon on that. It's all by faith. Again, receiving that righteousness, being covered by Christ. That's what God sees. It's wonderful. So yes, it's a time of introspection between trumpets and nouns, what the Jews teach anyway. It's a time of those of us in the New Covenant who have had the veil removed from our eyes. We see Yeshua. It's a time of great relief. To you Jewish people who are beginning to hear some of this, please respond. God is calling more and more Jews in Israel, Jews in America, Jews everywhere. God is calling more and more Costa Ricans and Nicaraguans God is calling more and more uh, people of Puerto Rico. Okay? God is calling people from all over. El Salvador. Yeah, you've got some vicious MS-13 people there. That's okay. They can repent too. Are you MS-13? You can repent. So it's a time of great joy because you can be forgiven. And this day pictures Christ reaching out to the rest of the world. Israel first, the nation of Israel. And then he reaches out to the rest of the world. And then we come into the millennial reign of Christ where he really reaches out to the rest of the world. This day is all about how much God the Father loves you. And it's all about the sacrifice of Yeshua to bring about the national, national acceptance and restoration, not just individual, but national. It's all about Yeshua and Him restoring us to ultimately who it's all about, God the Father. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, being, heart, mind, and soul, everything. Right? And Him alone shall you serve. It's about relationship. What a wonderful day it is. Our dear God in heaven, our Father, our Abba, our Daddy. We are sinners. But you don't see me and others as sinners anymore. You see us as redeemed and purified and cleansed and accepted. Accepted in the Beloved, it says in Colossians. Accepted in the Beloved. And Christ, by one offering, has perfected forever all of us who are being sanctified. Yeshua, thank you. Thank you. Father, thank you, thank you. 
help people see this. Help them see your love. Help them see your righteousness that you want to cover us all with. Yes, we have to go on to obey. Yes, we have to go on to let Christ live in us obediently, of course. But it's his righteousness and his life. Thank you, dear God in heaven. Thank you, Yeshua. Help us see it. Help us be thankful for you. And I pray again for the nations. I pay, pray for the people of Russia, for the people of Crimea and Ukraine, that they come to peace and that they come to you. I pray that they hear the gospel, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, that they hear that and they come to you. I pray that they will come to you, people in Africa, and love you and know you. They'll be a source of great light. We praise you and thank you and praise you again in Yeshua's mighty name. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for the Day of Atonement. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 270 sermons, and 300 blogs as a scriptural study resource for those who desire to know God the Father and His Son and His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting, and if you find these teachings beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.